Well, this morning we are continuing in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. And this morning we will finish chapter 13 in verses 31 to 35. I've entitled the sermon this morning, Calling Out the Foxes. Calling Out the Foxes. Why such a strange title to this sermon? Well, it's because Jesus calls out a fox, that is Herod, this earthly king and ruler. And a fox here, um, it, it, it represents the one who is sly, who is cunning, who is mischievous, and who most of all cannot stand in the way of God's purposes and plans. And what we see here today is the King of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is confronted by the threats of a human ruler, and Jesus is not afraid, not in the least. You'll remember that last week we finished this passage in verses 22 to 30 in which Jesus pleaded with men to enter through the narrow door. He told them that There are really two paths that you can go down in this life. One is broad, one is easy, and it leads to destruction. And the other is hard, and it is narrow, and it goes through the narrow door that enters into life. And you need to strive to enter into eternity through the narrow door who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he warns us that if we do not enter through the narrow door, if we do not strive to follow Jesus Christ, that we will be cast into that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This incredible warning in the previous verses is followed up now in verses 31 to 35 by human authorities threatening Jesus. So Jesus has just threatened them with eternal condemnation if they do not repent of their sins and follow Him. Jesus just warned them of the wrath that is to come and that you need to flee to Christ and you need to run to Him for your soul to be saved. And now human rulers come to Jesus in verse 31 and they say, yeah, but Jesus, King Herod is about to kill you. Luke 13, verse 31, the Word of God reads... At that very hour, meaning just as Jesus was finishing His warning to them about eternal hell and how they needed to enter through the narrow door, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, it's first interesting that it is some of the Pharisees who came to Jesus and warned Him. Now, almost all the Pharisees hated Jesus and wanted Him dead. There are a few Pharisees that we are told in John chapter 5 who who were afraid to um, profess faith in Christ publicly because they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God, John tells us in his gospel. We're told in John chapter 3 about Nicodemus, a Pharisee who, who came to Jesus at night to ask Him questions, and it seems that Nicodemus has faith in Christ, although it's really hard to tell what's going on with Nicodemus and whether or not he was willing to follow Christ publicly. Nonetheless, the majority of the Pharisees hated Jesus and wanted Him dead, while some of them seemed to recognize the truth of His message. But I don't know if any of them were publicly saying that they wanted to follow Jesus. There's no evidence of that. And so it's very interesting that in verse 31, you have Pharisees coming and warning Jesus. If they want Him dead, why would they warn Him? Well, it could be that there are some Pharisees who recognize the truth of Jesus' message and and they are following Him, at least they desire to follow Him. Maybe that's why it says some Pharisees, because they're a small group of the Pharisees, whereas the majority want Jesus dead. There are a few who might actually believe His message. That's a possibility. I think, though, more likely, especially with how Jesus responds to their warning, I think more likely that these Pharisees are actually trying to scare Jesus. They're trying to say to him, you better get out of here or you're going to be killed. And they want him killed. 
And they're trying to see if they can intimidate Jesus because ultimately their goal is to get Jesus to stop preaching this gospel that he's been preaching. Their their goal is to silence Jesus. And I think that is probably the intention of these Pharisees here because that comports with the rest of what we see in the Gospels and in what follows in the next verses where Jesus makes it very clear that he's not afraid of them, nor is he afraid of Herod. So because of the context, I think they're likely trying to intimidate Jesus into silence and Jesus' response will be, not a chance, buddy. (laughs) I'm not afraid of you at all and I'm not going to stop proclaiming this Gospel until the appointed time of my death. I think that is the force of what happens here. So they say to Jesus, get away from here. Notice, that is what they want. They want Jesus to leave. They want Jesus to stop preaching. They just want to shut him up. And by the way, we live in a world that wants us to just shut up about Jesus and his gospel, right? That just wants us to shut up about the truth of the Bible. What the Bible has to say about all of life. You see, they want us to keep our faith within the four walls of this church, and even that they would not be satisfied with because they want to destroy the churches across this land and this world. The kingdom of darkness, that which is evil, hates the light. And they seek to eradicate the light. And here they tell Jesus, if you don't get out of here, they're going to kill you. Herod is going to have you put to death. Well, Buddies, that's why Jesus came into this world, so that he would be put to death, okay? He is not afraid of dying, neither should we be. And more than that, I I notice in this passage that in trying to intimidate Jesus, Jesus doesn't back down or apologize at all. You know, we, we hear so much these days about being Christ-like. You know, I'll say something publicly like, you know, we can't redefine human sexuality or marriage. That God has given us a clear standard that marriage is between one man and one woman. And sure enough, some secularist who hates Jesus will say to me, oh, that's very Christian of you, pastor. You're supposed to love everybody. Well, first off, you don't get to define love. God does, and God defines love in His Word. And what's being celebrated in the month of June across this land, that is not love, that is an offense to a righteous and holy God. No, rather, when they try to threaten Jesus and scare Him, intimidate Him into silence, Jesus doubled down. You know what's Christ-like? Standing upon the truth and not apologizing for it. That's what Jesus did. I want to make this very clear to you. We've been going verse by verse through the first 13 chapters of Luke's gospel, and there's not been one time Jesus has backed down from the truth. He is a bold man of God. And if we are going to follow Jesus and His example, we do not have permission to back down from the truth. A lot of people think that to be Christ-like is to be a pushover and a wimp. I'm telling you that to be Christ-like is to boldly stand for the truth in the face of evil and dare evil to fight against that which God has spoken in His Word. A lot of people who think they are being Christ-like are actually doing the opposite of what Christ did in His earthly ministry and the opposite of what He commands us to do in His Word. After having all... After having done all things, stand firm. That is the command of God to us in His Word. Stand firm upon the truth. Do not back down. 1 Corinthians 15. Act like men. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't back down from the truth. Don't be ashamed of the truth. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. No matter what men may say or try to do to you, you don't deny me. You don't back down. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. When the world comes at us to threaten us, when the world tries to intimidate and scare us, we, like Jesus, are to double down on the truth and say, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Word of of God has to say, and I am more afraid of the judge of heaven and earth than I am of you. 
Look at how Jesus responds. This is a king who is threatening to have Jesus executed. And look at how Jesus responds in verse 32. He said to them, these Pharisees who had warned him that Herod would try to kill him, Jesus said to them, go and tell that fox. Oh, Jesus called him a name. I thought name calling was not Christ-like. Well, (laughs) the verse says what it says. Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. That's Jesus' response to Herod's threat. You go tell that fox that I'm not stopping. He can try to kill me, but he won't be able to. Because I have an appointed ministry and an appointed time at which I will die. And Jesus knows that he's going to die on a cross at Calvary. He's not going to be killed by Herod right here. He's not in Jerusalem yet. And he knows that his death will be at Jerusalem. George Whitfield, an English preacher in the 18th century, he preached throughout the American colonies and was one of the great preachers of the Great Awakening just before America became a nation, George Whitfield once said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. What that means, brothers and sisters, is God has appointed the span of your life. He has appointed the day that you were created in your mother's womb and the day of your birth, and He has appointed the day of your death. And until your work on earth is done, you indeed are immortal. Meaning, God is in control of when your life ends and no one else. God is sovereign over His creation. And that includes the day that we came into this world and the day that we will die. And Jesus is not afraid of Herod because His Father in heaven is more powerful than Herod. You understand that? Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. That, 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 if, that if you fear God, you need not fear man. That's what Whitfield meant when he said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. Look, I will, not day, I will not die before the day that God has appointed for me. And I do not know what that day is, but I am immortal until that day and I will live for Jesus and I will entrust my life to Him knowing that He will lead me, He will guide me, and He will protect me. And when He is ready to take me home, He will take me home. And no one will end my life a moment before the day that God has ordained. And if we understand that, we can live with great boldness knowing that my life is not in their hands. My life is in God's hands. And that's what Jesus says here. You go and tell that fox that I'm not going to stop preaching this gospel. Now why does He call him a fox? Well, If anyone knows anything about foxes, they are very sly, cunning, crafty creatures. Foxes are violent. But I think also the reason he calls him a fox is because a fox is really not a threat to us as humans. But a fox is a threat to chickens and rabbits and small little creatures, right? Now, if he had said, you go and tell that lion... Well, a lion would designate someone who is very powerful, someone that we ought to be afraid of, because would you rather have an an encounter in the woods with a fox or a lion? Obvious, right? I'll take the fox. I've seen foxes in the woods. You know what they do? They run when they see a human. A lion, different story entirely. I think the primary thrust of what Jesus is saying here, yes, Herod is a deceitful, crafty liar, He is crooked like a fox. That is true. He is a corrupt human authority. But also, he's not one that Jesus needs to be afraid of. He's more like a varmint. He's a nuisance. But Jesus has no need to fear that fox because his Father in heaven is in control, not Herod. Brothers and sisters, I am not denying that we need to 
render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, that we need to respect human authorities. But when human authorities tell us to sit down, shut up, and stop speaking the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a duty before our Creator to say, no, no, I will not stop speaking the truth. I will not back down from the truth of the Word of God. I respect our civil authorities and our human rulers insofar as they don't try to command me to disobey King Jesus. If they set a speed limit on the highway, you obey that speed limit. And no, I've not always been the best example of that. But anyways, those things which we can do that the law requires, pay your taxes, do those things. And no, I do not think that the way taxes are are incurred in this nation or or levied by our government in this nation is at all right. I, I think it is very oppressive. But my point is, insofar as we are able, we should obey human authorities. But when they tell us you can't gather to worship on Sunday, let me tell you something, that belongs to God and not to them. And I'll just tell you as your pastor, I said this when I came here, you knew this when you hired me, but just in case some of you are new, so you know, I'm not shutting this church down. I don't care what they say. They can come and drag me out of here in handcuffs. I'm not going to disobey the Lord when He commands us to meet together on His day. I am more afraid of God than I am of man, and so should you be too. He says, you go and tell that fox. I'm not afraid of him. He's a nuisance to me. You go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and I perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Now today, tomorrow and the third day, this was a Hebrew idiom to basically say, for the next near future, I'm going to go on and do these things. Today, tomorrow and the third day essentially was the concept of For the foreseeable future, this is what I'm going to do. That's kind of the concept. But notice how Jesus says it. I cast out demons and perform cures today, tomorrow, and the third day. That's what you would expect. But then comes the last phrase at the end of verse 32. And I finish my course. On the third day, he'll finish his course. What is he talking about? You know, it's interesting that we see in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that you know, Christ appeared, died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. That he was raised from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures, meaning the Old Testament Scriptures. And as I go back into the Old Testament and look, where does it predict the resurrection of Christ on the third day? There are really two places that I can think of that seem to indicate this. Jesus had told them that His generation would only receive the sign of Jonah. We saw that earlier in Luke's Gospel. Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days and three nights, and on the third day, he was brought out of the big fish. And I believe when Jesus said that this generation would only receive the sign of Jonah meant that after three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, or in Jesus' case, in the belly of the earth, that's how Matthew explains what Jesus said, by the way. When Matthew quotes that in his gospel, he says he was talking about his burial and his resurrection on the third day. So there does seem to be in Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah spends three days and three nights in the belly of the big fish and then is vomited up, There does seem to be there a a foreshadowing of what would happen to Christ in the tomb for three days and three nights and on the third day brought back. But even more so, I think this is likely a reference to the prophet Hosea. Now toward the end of your Old Testament, the prophet Hosea, his prophecy is um, the first of the last 12 prophets in your Old Testament. They They're known as the minor prophets. And Hosea said this in Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us so that He may heal us. He has struck us down and He will bind us up. God had brought judgment upon the nation of Israel. 
And Hosea says, but even though God has brought judgment on us, He will restore us if we will turn to Him, if we will repent, is the idea of that Hebrew word. And then it says in Hosea 6 verse 2, after two days He will revive us, and on the third day He will raise us up so that we may live before Him. I believe in Hosea 6 verse 2, though it might not have been clear When it was originally given, I believe in Hosea 6 verse 2, we indeed have a prophecy of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. After two days, He will revive us, and on the third day, He will raise us up. Because in Christ's resurrection, we too have eternal life by faith in Him. So His resurrection becomes our resurrection. Because He is risen from the grave, so too those who trust in Christ will one day rise from the grave and have eternal life like He does. On the third day, He will raise us up so that we may live before Him. That is, have eternal life, never to die again. I believe that Jesus is alluding here to Hosea 6 verse 2. And possibly Jonah chapter 2, which was really a a foreshadowing of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew and his gospel. So Jesus says... I'm going to cast out demons and perform cures. In other words, I'm going to continue my ministry. I'm going to keep doing miracles. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. I'm not afraid of Herod. I'm not going to back down. I'm going to continue as if nothing has happened because I have a mission from my God the Father in heaven and I am going to do what He has sent me to do and no one's going to tell me to stop. So I'm going to keep doing this today, tomorrow, and the third day... I will finish my course. And here, he uses a word that is used at Christ on the cross, teleo, to finish, to complete. In John's gospel, he says it in a way that that means, I have completed my mission. It is finished, to telestai. It's the idea of bringing to completion all of God's purpose and plan. And he uses the same root Greek word here, teleo, to say, on the third day, I will complete my mission. I will finish my course. Meaning the death, burial, and resurrection. And in rising from the dead, he will defeat sin and death and secure eternal life for all who turn from their sins and trust in him by faith. On the third day, I will finish my course. And the point is, is Herod ain't going to stop me. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from His hand, the song says. The reality is, is no one, no one has power and authority over the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. Do you understand we follow and serve the ruler of heaven and earth? And His authority is far greater than all earthly rulers and powers and authorities. This is why Psalm 2 says to the rulers of this earth, you better kiss the Son lest He be angry with you and you perish in the way. Psalm 2 is a warning to earthly rulers. You better respect Jesus. (laughs) Because He is your King. He is the King of kings. And if He has to bring earthly rulers into judgment, he will. You tell that fox, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but on the third day, I'll finish my course. And when my work on earth is done, then I will die and then rise. But I will not be taken out a moment before the appointed time. He's going to a cross on Mount Calvary and he will not be deterred or delayed by King Herod. Verse 33, Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Again, today, tomorrow, and the day following, this Hebrew idiom of for the foreseeable future. So so Jesus recognizes that he only has a short time left. 
He's in the final days of his ministry. He's headed toward Jerusalem where he knows he will die. He knows his time is short. So he says, I'll go on my way today, tomorrow, and the day following. But I'm going to Jerusalem. Why? Because it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem had a history of killing the prophets of God. So here, in verses 32 and 33, we see Jesus' response to Herod. Which is, no way. I'm not backing down because he threatened me. But now, in verses 34 and 35, Jesus pleads with the people of Israel to turn back to him. He says in verse 34, speaking to the people gathered there that day who were listening to this interaction. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. Or as some translations render it, your house is left Desolate. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what is going on here? Well, there is so much in these two verses, verses 34 and 35 at the end of Luke 13. First off, he cries out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, repeating the name of the city twice because he had great affection for this city. And notice the name of the city in Hebrew, Jerusalem. It means city of peace. And if you know anything about Jerusalem in the Bible and today, it's anything but a city of peace. Amen? It has been fought over more than any piece of ground in world history. It's been anything but a city of peace. Why is it called that by God then? Because one day it will be. One day Jesus is going to come back. And they're going to beat their swords into plowshares, Isaiah says. He's going to put an end to all warfare. It will cease. There will be peace on earth in that day. You see... What we are witnessing in the violence and the evil around this world, across the world, not just in Jerusalem, but everywhere in God's creation today, what we are witnessing today will soon come to an end. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming back soon. And when He comes back, He will put an end to all the evil and the violence and the misery of this earth. He is making all things new. The the things that we suffer right now are temporary and He will put an end to them. That's the first thing I want you to understand. It's called the city of peace because it will be the city of peace one day soon. Because Jesus is coming back there. And He's going to set all wrongs right. And He's going to put an end to all warfare and all violence and all evil. And I long for that day. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. What is he talking about here? Well, Jesus mentions in Matthew's Gospel that Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, Zechariah who wrote that book in the Old Testament, that that he was killed in the temple, in the most holy place. We are told that they stoned Jeremiah, they threw him into a pit, They rejected Isaiah and Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Elijah, Elisha, Moses. Think of all the prophets that they rejected again and again in the Old Testament. I find this amazing and the thought just occurs to me, so let me find it quickly. It's at the end of 2 Chronicles. It's an amazing, an amazing passage. And though I did not think of this before now, I really think that the way that 2 Chronicles ends is, is very important. It says there that, here we go, 2 Chronicles 36, I want to begin in verse 15. Now, understand something, that the Hebrew Old Testament, they had the same 39 books of the Old Testament, but the way that the Hebrews, and that is those in Jesus' day, 
the way that they arranged their Old Testament books, same books, but they were in a different order, their Old Testament ended with 2 Chronicles. So this was how the end of their Bible read, okay? They only had the Old Testament, and 2 Chronicles was the last book in their order of books. And this is how the end of their Bible read. 2 Chronicles 36, I want to begin in verse 15. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by His messengers, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. We're talking about Jerusalem here. He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place, but they kept mocking the messengers of God and despising His words and scoffing at His prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against His people until there was no remedy. Jesus here in Luke 13, 34 is referring to how under the Old Covenant they constantly rejected the prophets of God. But I want you to notice something in verse 34. Notice how Jesus explains how all the prophets in the Old Testament were rejected by the city of Jerusalem and they stoned and they killed the prophets. Notice what he says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered your children together. Wait a minute. Jesus would have gathered them together? In the Old Testament? When Isaiah spoke to them? When Jeremiah spoke to them? When Zechariah spoke to them? Yes. Jesus was there. Remember, He is God incarnate. You remember this last Christmas season? I preached a series of Christophanies, appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. And I showed you a number of passages in the Old Testament where the Son of God, Jesus, before His incarnation, appears in the Old Testament. And many of the New Testament authors tell us that's Jesus there in Isaiah 6, according to John in his Gospel in chapter 12. So so we have passages in the Old Testament where the New Testament authors say that the one who appeared there, that angel of the Lord, was Jesus calling out to Abraham not to sacrifice his son. That was Jesus calling out to Moses from the burning bush. Well, Well, I thought he was Yahweh. Yes, he is. Jesus is Yahweh. He is the Lord. He is the one true and living God. And He was there calling out to His people through the prophets. That's why Jesus says, how often I would have gathered you. Not not just God would have gathered you. That's what I would say if I were speaking to them, right? You know, God would have forgiven you if you would have just turned back to them. Back to Him. But what does Jesus say? If you would have turned back to me, I would have forgiven you. How often I would have gathered you. Understand, not only is Jesus claiming to be God here, not only is He claiming deity, but He's saying, I'm the one who sent those prophets in the Old Testament. And when you rejected Isaiah, when you rejected Zechariah, when you rejected Moses, you rejected me, Jesus says. He's saying, I was there in the Old Testament when the prophets called out to you. And you rejected me and I was willing to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings to protect them. I would have forgiven you. And you refused. That's why 2 Chronicles ends with they rejected His prophets. They scoffed at Him until God's wrath rose up against them and there was no remedy. God destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. when He sent the armies of Nebuchadnezzar to absolutely obliterate the city. And Jesus says, under the Old Covenant, I was there. And I would have forgiven you if you would have just repented. If you would have just turned back to me. And brothers and sisters, what was true of them in that day is still true in our day. Any sinner who will repent, He will forgive. He will protect you under the shadow of His wings, Isaiah promises. And Jesus promises here. I would protect you under my wings. I would receive you instantly if you would just turn back from your sin and trust 
in me. And brothers and sisters, this plea, this offer of forgiveness of sins stands good for every creature under heaven who will turn back to Him. Don't you understand that through this gospel message, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling out to you to repent and turn to Him and He will forgive you and He will shelter you under His wings. Oh, how often I would have gathered you. I gave you multiple opportunities to turn back and repent. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. With all that grace, with all that mercy, with all that opportunity, they still rejected Him because their hearts were hard and they hated the truth. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that no one goes to hell who can blame God for their being there. Every sinner who perishes, perishes because of his or her own sin. They don't get to blame God for it. It's so common in our day. People, it's, it's, it seems that all people do anymore, they play the victim. They have excuses. They never take accountability for their sins and their wrongdoings. Our world is full of it, right? We'll blame anything. We'll blame our upbringing. We'll blame the color of our skin. We'll blame the fact that we didn't have enough money or we weren't as privileged as other people and on and on and on and on. But people never want to take accountability for their own sins. And Jesus says, if you would just repent, if you just own up to your sin, if you just confess your sin and turn back, He says, I'll forgive you. But I won't forgive you unless you repent. You can't go to heaven living like hell. You have to repent. You have to turn back. You have to surrender to Christ. And the problem was they weren't willing because their hearts were so hard. They hated Jesus and His gospel so much, they refused to repent. And so they perished. Verse 35, Jesus says, Behold, your house is forsaken. Behold here is a, it's a word that indicates God's judgment against them. He says, your house is forsaken. And this is probably to be understood as a reference to the temple. Because very soon that temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. We're here in about the year A.D. 30. And about 40 years later, in the year A.D. 70, the armies of Tiberius would come into Jerusalem and absolutely destroy the city and the temple there. And you can go to Jerusalem today and see the very little bit of one of the walls that's left. But that temple was absolutely destroyed. And he tells them it's going to happen. He says, behold, your house is forsaken. God has decided to destroy the temple that he commanded them to build. Your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now here he is alluding to Psalm 118 verse 26. And I believe that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is a reference to his second coming at the end of time in history. Some think that this is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem when he brought judgment upon them in the year A.D. 70. That is certainly a possible interpretation. But as I read this phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord throughout the Old and New Testament, it seems to me to clearly indicate his second coming when he will come at the very end of human history. And what he is saying is, is if you do not repent and turn back to me now, you will not see me again until that final day when I come in judgment and cast you into the lake of fire. Which he's really repeating his warning from the previous verses that we looked at last Sunday. Strive to enter by the narrow gate. Because if you don't enter by the narrow door, you will perish. 
And he ends this by saying, if you don't repent now, you won't see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the only problem is, it'll be too late to repent then. Better you repent now and your soul be saved then you wait until the final day when He comes in judgment and you be cast into the lake of fire. So when will it be? And notice what doesn't happen in this passage. We are not told that the people repented, are we? Isn't that interesting? You might think surely with Jesus, the Son of God Himself, preaching to them, you realize Jesus is the greatest preacher who ever lived, right? You might think if Jesus came and preached the sermon that everyone would be saved. But they weren't. Is it Jesus' fault? Were there something lacking in His words? Not at all. He's the sovereign creator of heaven and earth. He did not lack the, the right words or the power or the capacity to save them. Their hearts were hard and He let them have their own way. And He let them perish. Brothers and sisters, souls are not saved because the preacher is so eloquent. Souls are not saved because you're so good at sharing the gospel. Souls are saved because there is a powerful God who sits on His throne in heaven who is able to save the souls of men and women. Now we are commanded to go and share this gospel. Don't think that because you're not the one who can save people that you don't have a responsibility to go and make disciples of all the nations. The Great Commission still applies to every one of us. I'm just saying when a soul is saved, it is because God has saved them, not because you or I are so eloquent. You understand? All the credit and the salvation of souls goes to God. And none of the credit is ours. Brothers and sisters, this is a very real warning. Those who do not repent, they will perish. And Jesus is offering, I will gather you under my wings and protect you from my judgment. And they reject Him. And so they perished. And so do many still perish today. I'm pleading with you. If you have not repented of your sins and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be gathered under His wings, to be saved and sheltered by Him, do so now before it's too late. Because one day He will come in judgment and the peoples of the earth will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The only problem is, if you wait until that day, it will be eternally too late. So turn to him now, while you still can. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word in each one here today. And Lord, how I ask that we would be humbled by the words of Jesus here as we hear him cry out to the city of Jerusalem, and that we would understand that He is also crying out to us to turn from our sin and come to Him. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to be faithful to make this same plea to our friends and our neighbors and our family members, our co-workers, those around us in this community and to the ends of the earth, that we would plead with them to come to Christ before it's too late. Thank you that we are offered this great salvation in Christ. Now, Lord, grant us the grace and the faith to follow Jesus until he comes again. Help us to be faithful, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.